So just to give you a quick background about you know our company, uh, essentially what we uh, provide is uh, uh, tools and platforms to enable people to be able to do deep learning without any DevOps and infrastructure management. So uh, that's kind of what we do. And what we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about today is essentially uh, how we generally you know uh, uh, have our users and you know how we ourselves use uh, Jupyter in a way where we can elastically attach GPUs onto Jupyter, uh, thereby minimizing the total cost of ownership that you have on GPUs. Because GPUs, you know, sometimes for test and dev, you can probably uh, use it in an optimal way to keep your cost very low. And I'm, I'm going to go through a couple of, you know, uh, marketing slides. You know, I'm just going to rush through them because everybody kind of knows these things. Uh, uh, essentially, you know, deep learning, you know, it's kind of like gold rush right now. You know, it's it's almost impacted every industry. You know, robotics, entertainment, automotive, you know, finance, uh, healthcare, education. Essentially, uh, deep learning and AI is kind of like the the next dot com, or it's already the dot com, kind of the dot com. So every company or every business, you add AI to it, it kind of makes sense. So just kind of why this is really, really, you know, a hot area. And I think AI is probably the thing that is, you know, uh, going to be much bigger than the dot com. Uh, some people call it the post-industrial revolution. So why Jupiter? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we are Jupiter fans, so we should just talk a little bit about why Jupiter, right? You know, um, Jupiter. You know, uh, some people call it an IDE. Some people call it a development environment. You know, some people call it uh, you know kind of like a tool. Some people call it a, you know a programming environment. Um, you know, I think it's all of the above, you know, it's just not just one thing. Um, you know, the whole the whole idea of Jupiter is for when you're doing development, it kind of allows us to essentially uh, tell a story uh, while we are writing code, uh, and we can iteratively write code. And the uh, ability to share notebooks is phenomenal. And you know, when I first you know uh, came across Jupiter, uh, I used to be a Vim and an Emacs guy, and I now I actually use Jupiter pretty much as an IDE. For a lot of things I actually do, so it's you know it's it's, it's really uh, you know uh, one of the best tools uh, I've seen. Um, it's got multi-language support. Uh, well, the most important thing that I really like the third is the in-browser uh, developer environment. Uh, just to give you actually a thing, you know my laptop didn't have the uh, you know I didn't have the uh, the cable to connect to HDMI. Mine is the new Mac, uh, so Apple keeps changing their interfaces. So. I had no idea, no idea how to actually do a demo. So thanks to Jupyter that I can actually run it on a browser, um, I just leveraged Stephen's laptop to be able to kind of you know, show a demo. So you know, that's uh, so I really like the third feature. Um, it's collaborative. You know, uh, people can essentially collaborate and share. Um, you know, we can reproduce things. It's extendable. Uh, in fact, we have actually extended Jupyter. Uh, to use this concept of elastic GPU, which I'll go over. So it's pretty extensible. The community is very, you know, uh, sporting, um, especially for deep learning, uh, um, you know, and machine learning, uh, even as an overarching thing. We can show a lot of visualizations, and you know, we can show a lot of you know, data analytics, etc., right within Jupyter. So this, you know, it's, 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 which is why you know we have this conference, right? Uh, you know, so. Some of the things that we basically you know, use, uh, you know, essentially as the best practices for doing, you know, uh, deep learning uh, with Jupyter. Uh, before I do that, before I say that, how many people in this room, you know, kind of actually do convolution neural nets with Jupyter? Okay. Um, I'm assuming rest of the people. I mean, how many people in the room use Jupyter for machine learning? Okay. So I'm assuming the rest of the folks you know, kind of use Jupyter for various, you know, other statistical things, I guess. Um, so essentially, when we are basically doing you know uh, you know deep learning uh, with Jupyter, some of the best practices that we have seen uh, is you know we use Docker um, you know essentially as a package uh, way to essentially access Jupyter, um, and essentially you know we basically do essentially a port mapping wherever the Docker container is, so that we can essentially map it to any kind of local host and just run the Docker, and uh, we use essentially a persistent data volume uh, to store our data. Uh, and code. So essentially, we have a data volume, which I'll kind of show over uh, using you know uh, our dev environment. Uh, we use Git essentially to pretty much you know Git and GitHub to kind of you know save code and you know kind of uh, use it as a, essentially a, sometimes even a temporary repository as well as a more persistent repository for versioning, reproducibility, etc. And uh, 
again, we leverage examples as much as possible because there's a ton of Jupyter notebooks that is there. In fact, uh, sometimes we don't need actually PowerPoints uh, for explaining anything. We just need a Jupyter notebook. And that basically is like the, you know, uh, the PowerPoint or the documentation. Um, well, this is uh, another you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, slide which kind of tells you like, hey, CPUs versus GPUs. Uh, how many people in the room actually use GPUs for your work? Okay, pretty good. So you know, I mean, as, as, you, as you kind of know, you know uh, GPUs are you know, some, about, uh, an order of magnitude, or sometimes two orders of magnitude faster than you know, CPUs, uh, especially for you know, uh, certain types of workloads, which you know, happens to kind of fall in the machine learning, uh, deep learning you know, uh, space. And uh, the primary thing with GPUs is with each new generation of GPUs, it's just phenomenal. Uh, at which you know uh, the uh, uh, the processing power has increased. Uh, before Pascal, when Pascal came in, it was basically you know five to ten times faster than the previous one. Then now Volta, which is going to be coming in uh, end of the year, is going to essentially begin you know at least four to five times faster than the previous generation. At some point, I think you know Moore's law is probably going to hit you know uh, GPUs as well. Uh, but we'll see you know, and that's probably why people are kind of building ASICs uh, like you know the tensor processing unit and a lot of companies building essentially ASICs to do kind of like graph based uh, you know algorithms etc you know uh, much better than even potentially even uh, doing it in a traditional gpu but then when gpus are the new volta is going to basically have a tensor unit uh, which is kind of like something uh, people can leverage directly for you know uh, convolution neural nets essentially some of the essentially functions are pretty much baked in hardware um, you know, sometimes you know when, however, CPUs are still good for certain things. Uh, you can use it for like you know dev and test, just learning, initial prototyping. Uh, you can essentially use your existing infrastructure. Pretty much everybody has a CPU. Uh, you know, machine. Every laptop has a CPU. Um, most of the data prep and transformations are still done on CPUs. Um, sometimes inference, you know, is kind of done on CPUs today, uh, especially when things are not at massive scale. Uh, you know, it has, you know, uh, CPUs do have uh, much more maturity than a GPU because CPUs is uh, it's kind of like the, the very most important first class citizen. It's got multitasking, you know, uh, it's got more memory, uh, which, is, which is kind of actually, you know, good. Uh, you can over provision your memory, sort of the virtual memory concept. Uh, you can basically do state tracking, you can do resilience, all these things, you know, CPUs have. So, the, uh, so the reason I'm actually you know, saying that is, you know, as uh, the next in the next slide, I'm going to be kind of showing you the life cycle of essentially uh, deep learning development, where you have a development and then you do some training of your neural nets, large scale training, and then you do a deployment. So mostly in the development, and then people do development on the CPUs or GPUs. Um, and when people are actually using GPUs, you essentially uh, sometimes log into the whole GPU machine and use the GPU machine, you know, all the time. Even though most of the time you are sitting and writing code or typing code, pretty much. Um, and I'll kind of, you know, kind of tie it all together, uh, you know, um, in the next few minutes on how elastic GPUs and what I'm going to be kind of showing kind of ties into, you know, why uh, it's important when people are doing a development on CPUs. Most of the development is happening on the CPUs today. Uh, again, slide kind of shows the development. As you finish your development, you do your training. That's where you run massive, you know, GPU uh, forms where you kind of want to do your training much faster uh, because there's a lot of you know data that's there. And then you finish your training and then say, okay, here's a neural net. I want to deploy it. You know, create a bunch of uh, functions and you kind of deploy it on edge nodes or you know whatever nodes that you want to deploy it to. So, uh, however, when you look at GPUs, you know. Um, GPUs are not, you know, not, not, not cheap, right? So if you look at the cloud instance pricing, uh, you know, AWS, uh, these are these may be a little dated, uh, you know, uh, these are about a few months old, but I think the price has not changed uh, significantly. If you really look at actually a per year pricing of actually using a GPU on AWS or IBM or Azure or you know, Google, you know, to basically use essentially about half a K80 um, cost about close to eight thousand dollars per year. And if you really want to essentially use about eight KADs, you know, eight GPUs, costs about $130,000 per year. You just don't see it, but it just keep quickly keeps adding up. Um, but most of the time, we're just typing. You know, basically, we basically get a machine and say, okay, I'm just going to sit and type. And while the GPUs are sitting idle, GPUs are not really even being used. And majority of the, you know, even the application runtime is still using CPUs, even when you're running the application. So, 
What we've actually kind of uh, done is this concept of elastic GPUs, where you can basically attach GPUs to any CPU nodes. So very similar to the concept of storage. Uh, how you do network attached storage or EFS, where you basically have a storage node and you basically have some you know, CPU nodes, um, just like you know how you can attach storage through a network onto a CPU node. Uh, we basically have actually created a way where you can attach GPUs uh, onto any CPU node. And what that really means is, for example, if my laptop does not have any GPUs, um, let's say if I have another workstation with GPUs, uh, what I could actually do is I could basically remotely attach the GPU onto my laptop kind of make it look like, you know, uh, it's like a first-class citizen, just like how you basically, you know, when you want to attach NFS, you don't really go and keep buying disk uh, to your laptop. You just attach something in a shared, uh, shared drive. And uh, so the advantage of that is basically, you know, of course, you know, running things on a native GPU is going to be much more performant. Uh, but uh, for a lot of cases where you're doing test and dev, it's pretty, easy, uh, pretty useful because most of the times you're basically making sure your code works, making sure your, like, things actually work in multi-GPU, things kind of actually scale. In those cases, it really works very well. So essentially, for example, if I, let's say if I have, say, just two GPU nodes, and let's say about 10 or 20 you know, uh, developers wanting to actually leverage it, what uh, you could do is basically install you know, essentially a software on all the workstations or all, all the laptops and basically install the software on GPU nodes and pretty much access the GPU everywhere, essentially. You know, um, same, you know, in a, even a data center uh, as well in the same way where I can basically create these different SKUs. For example, I can basically say I can get, a user can get a 0.5 GPU or 1 GPU or 2 GPU or 3 GPU or 4 GPU at runtime as opposed to hogging on the GPU all the time. Again, when it comes to the cloud, it becomes very interesting where I can basically now attach you know, GPUs to large memory instances. For example, you know, AWS has you know, uh, you know, like large memory instances, different, different types of SKUs. So now I can basically create like, you know, new SKUs on the fly. Uh, and I'll kind of show you guys you know, what that means kind of in a demo as well. Uh, I can basically you know, attach it to essentially uh, the, the, the X1 instances that AWS has, the, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, the, which is over a terabyte. I can basically attach GPUs to that. I can attach GPUs to a T2 micro or a T2 nano or a T2 small. And uh, now essentially, just like how I do elastic you know, file storage. Uh, by the way, how many people here you know, use AWS for their stuff? Cool. Uh, how many people use Azure? Just curious. Google? IBM, probably not, I guess. All right, it's one, okay, good. So the way, actually, we, we do this thing is basically you know, uh, through something that we wrote called you know, application interception. So basically what it does is, you know, if you look at GPUs, you know, most of the GPU code is all, you know, if it, the, so GPUs, the, the, so many types of GPUs, but then um, the real majority of GPUs are all NVIDIA GPUs. And especially if you look at deep learning, most of it is pretty much run on NVIDIA GPUs. So if you look at actually you know, any NVIDIA GPUs or any GPUs, they all support you know, uh, essentially a particular runtime. For example, NVIDIA supports CUDA. So what we basically have is we basically have a software that we kind of wrote. It, it essentially intercepts CUDA and remote executes the CUDA calls on other machines. You know, which has the GPUs. For example, if I'm basically running, it, it basically runs like an application on, on the node, uh, kind of like a daemon or an agent. So it basically intercepts uh, the CUDA calls, all the CUDA functions, and it kind of you know, remote executes on any, you know, any GPU or any sort of GPU that you have. And again, it all works through TCP IP uh, in a client-server configuration. But to the application, it kind of looks like what's shown on the right it all looks like a single machine. So it basically, for example, you know, when you do, let's say, uh, a native NVIDIA SMI command, which kind of shows you the list of GPUs that you have in your machine, it'll show as if you have all the GPUs. So it, for the applications or for the people who are using it, they don't even see the difference. I'll kind of show you guys where I'm going to be able to show you, hey, a bunch of GPUs on a single machine. And when you do that, you know, essentially, you want, and, and this is kind of like the architecture of how we actually do it. Essentially, we have this thing, you know, uh, we call it uh, like a Bitfusion client, you know, which is running essentially on a CPU node. Uh, it could be running on a GPU node as well, uh, where you could basically have two GPU nodes and we can combine the GPUs across both the nodes and create a really massive, powerful node as well, so that people don't have to even write distributed code. Um, so essentially, it basically works through a client server architecture. Um, so essentially, we essentially have a CPU server, we have a GPU server, um, essentially uh, Bitfusion client intercepts everything, and there's a server that's running on uh, the GPU uh, 
in a node, and we essentially remote execute the calls. And you know, we kind of manage all the you know micro scheduling and everything under the hood. And just to give you some performance, you know, uh, data. Um, when we like, we we did a lot of work in essentially uh, overlapping data movement as much as possible and hiding inside compute as much as possible, and a lot of performance optimization tricks. So we've actually seen that when you actually have, let's say, even on 10 gig, when you have a CPU node and a GPU node connected together, and let's say an application is running on a CPU node and remotely running on a GPU node, the performance is very close to native, as if you know, you're like running on a local. Of course, as you scale your GPUs, you know there, you do get CCs and performance hits. But again, uh, I think the world is kind of moving towards infinite band. Uh, you know, the next uh, few years anyway, especially driven by deep learning. So when that happens, pretty much it's going to be you know, pretty close to PCI speeds. Um, here's another thing that we can actually do, which is really cool, uh, because because we're actually intercepting everything. We can also actually split GPUs. For example, let's say you let's say you have let's say a single GPU, a server or a workstation with less one GPU, and let's say you have like four developers wanting to basically access it, right? And as you know, uh, TensorFlow is very greedy. Uh, where let's say if TensorFlow is basically using a GPU, it doesn't give it to anybody else. So what we actually could do is we could basically set policies where you say uh, split this GPU into four pieces. And each, GP, each user or each you know, developer gets one-fourth of the GPU. Again, uh, the performance is, of course, going to be one-fourth of what you would actually done on a full GPU, uh, but uh, you could at least actually use it. And we can basically you know, allocate uh, uh, a particular uh, size of GPU memory uh, to the user. Uh, one of the things we're actually also doing it is we're also um, you know, going to be adding a way to essentially over-provision the memory. So which means we could basically, so if you have a, uh, a 12 gig you know, GPU, uh, we could basically run uh, essentially uh, two applications which basically has 12 gig, you know, which requires 12 gigs of GPU memory. So essentially slicing the GPU but also kind of increasing the memory a little bit. Again, all these things is basically done through the interception uh, you know, uh, layer that we've kind of actually written. And I'll kind of show you guys in a demo uh, all these things tied together using in a workspace a little bit. Again, why, you know, why elastic GPUs, right? Again, most of the people basically start with a small team. Uh, you basically you know, uh, as your team grows, you want to basically increase your GPU servers. But then, let's say, what if everybody in the company wants to basically access the GPUs? You can't really you know, provide uh, you know, uh, GPUs to everybody in the, in the company. I mean, we had this, we had this customer where uh, there was a, a the development team, you know, AI development team, which owned all the GPUs. Then, some, but some people in the application teams or in the IT teams, they actually wanted to use the GPUs, but these guys did never want to give the GPUs to them uh, because, like, and of course, they get more priority because they were, on, you know, they were kind of in the CTO organization, and they would actually never want to give the thing to anybody else. But everybody wants to use it. So here, you know, you could basically install essentially uh, kind of the uh, the software on all the CPU machines, on limited number of GPU machines, but. Everybody can get pretty much get you know access, uh, and we call it sort of like a, a democratized access of GPUs everywhere, right? Because once you have access to you know uh, essentially amazing hardware, amazing technology, you know people come up with new innovative things, and it may or may not be just the people who have you know uh, privilege, right? So, I mean, it's just kind of why we have a lot of startups you know coming up with new ideas, and not just Google and Amazon coming up with the greatest ideas. Um, again, you know, essentially the whole idea is to make it enterprise-wide, you know, adoption. Uh, again, uh, a few more, you know, things where you, know, you can basically start your development on a CPU machine, you know, attach essentially an elastic GPU from within a, you know, a node. Can, you can attach additional GPUs, just like you attach storage. Hey, I just want more GPUs, just like I attach storage today to a, you know, EFS. Or I can basically even, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, partial, you know, create partial GPUs extra, right? Uh, again, uh, now I, I went through this, you know, before, which is basically the client-server, you know, mode. Again, uh, you know, split GPUs. Um, I could also actually run, like, you know, essentially, you know, multiple applications can be run, multiple users can actually be run. It's multi-tenant. Uh, you can do all sort of things once you have access to this, you know, uh, this kind of an infrastructure. Uh, so one of the things we actually did was basically with Jupyter, what we did essentially is. Uh, we basically essentially add the added a capability where when you run Jupyter uh, with we call it the Bitfusion client, uh, it basically uses a CPU most of the time. Only when it's using the GPU, it goes and fetches out fetches the GPU that you need. Till then, it's not even actually you know uh, the GPU is not even allocated. It's, it's it could be used by another user uh, as opposed to essentially you know hogging the GPU. So essentially, only when you're running your code, it uses the GPU. So when you're typing not even using the GPU. And uh, we have this ability where you can basically have multiple users. Each user can get like half a GPU, quarter GPU, or even like you know, uh, GPUs beyond uh, what is available in a single node. 
Uh, when we started the thing, what we did was we basically you know, modified the kernel to essentially uh, add elastic GPUs to, for example, a, a Python process that's basically run. But then as we kind of you know, um, may, you know, uh, progress, now what we do is we basically hold we wrap the whole Jupyter, kind of like this GPU virtualization, so that it kind of inherently, you know, automatically knows uh, essentially the resource management piece, you know, uh, in it. You know, it does, we don't need to do any any change. I'll kind of show you guys in a demo, you know, that particular piece. Again, you know, um, so we actually wrap this all around and actually, you know, uh, sell this as a product as well, and we have, we have it a, as an AMI on Amazon as well, where uh, we call it Flex. Essentially, it's essentially a, a DevOps and infrastructure management. You know, development platform for deep learning and AI. So basically, it's like a dev cockpit, uh, so that uh, data scientists or developers, uh, without the help of IT, can kind of manage the GPU infrastructure and also manage their deep learning workflows. We we provide pre-installed you know containers uh, which are already you know optimized. Uh, we actually by default we basically provide Jupyter, uh, you know, in our you know uh, in our software. Okay, uh, uh, the whole life cycle that I showed before kind of changes a little bit where you know, when I'm actually doing my development, they can basically use this thing to essentially use all the pre-installed you know, containers, et cetera, and then start with my CPUs and then just attach GPUs as and when I need it. And then when I'm training it, I can basically kind of scale out beyond my node and combine GPUs across multiple nodes and scale out my training. And then when I'm doing deployment, I can scale down or scale up you know, depending on what I want to do. Right. And uh, this kind of picture kind of shows you know, how this is all set up in the cloud as well as on-prem. For example, you have a local environment where you can basically pretty much, you know, for example, if a laptop doesn't have a GPU, for example, you know, uh, my laptop doesn't have a GPU. This is, you know, this is, this is a, it only has an integrated you know, uh, uh, graphics card. Right? So now I can basically have the thing where I can basically attach a GPU onto this laptop. Um, or even in a cluster environment, I can basically just log into my CPU machines and do all the things. Um, so here it kind of shows, hey, you start with essentially a single node, a laptop, and then you quickly move into a cluster on your CPU node, and then you attach GPUs as much as possible, and then you, know, you can essentially do even more batch processing uh, and combine GPUs across multiple machines to do a large-scale training, and then from there you can basically you know, push things to production, and uh, you know, uh, we provide some uh, uh, you know, uh, easy ways for people to manage this as well. Again, the value is essentially, you know, it basically reduces the time to market for people, right? And you know, essentially, today in this world, you know, who wants to be sitting and doing DevOps and infrastructure management? Uh, if it's not, if it's not my business, I don't want to be doing it. So essentially, it reduces the overall life cycle all the way from setup time to deployment. Uh, with that, I'll kind of you know, switch to a quick demo, uh, you know, kind of showing you know uh, all these pieces. So I'm going to just to Chrome. How much time do we have? Do we have? Okay, cool. So this, you know, uh, I have a couple of I have a few demo environments that I have. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes whenever I actually show a demo, you know, sometimes like you know, an environment doesn't work, so I have a few backups. So this environment, if it basically kind of still works, it was working just before I started the demo. Uh, this got uh, uh, about eight GPU servers and one CPU server. Okay, uh, the CPU machine doesn't have any GPUs. It's got eight GPU servers, and each GPU server has about eight, uh, you know, uh, P100s. It's about uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty beefy cluster. And I'll kind of show you like a few things, you know, uh, in the cluster I can do. Okay, cool. So I basically, you know, it's basically it's got about, you know, eight, you know, uh, eight, you know, I think, I think, uh, I think somebody must have dropped it. So, uh, so six actually. So I lied. Uh, and then it's got a CPU machine here, right? So 
I'm going to spin up a workspace that I already have, you know, which is a Jupyter workspace. So essentially, the whole concept of this software is just to, before I actually show here, it essentially brings in like a, like a simple cloud environment, you know, within a simple machine learning environment that people can just use uh, on top of any infrastructure, on top of Amazon, on top of, you know, uh, your own on-prem or whatever, you know, you have. And by the way, how many people here actually have on-prem, you know, you know, clusters, or, you know, like their own data center? Okay, cool. So I can basically create multiple users. I can basically, like, you know, for example, I can set limits to user as to how many GPUs they have are allowed to use at a max, uh, and, and things like that, right? So, and if I have more time, I'll kind of show you all the features here. So, but for now, you know, this is basically running on a CPU machine. This this workspace is running on a CPU machine, and it has the ability to attach a remote GPU at any time when you want to basically, you know, when you are using a GPU call, it will basically use a remote GPU. So I'm going to just, you know, spin up this Jupyter workspace that is there. Um, And, you know, and Flex is essentially, uh, think of it as like a development platform for people doing you know, deep learning development. It comes with you know, pre-installed containers with all the frameworks, but you can also bring your own framework, own containers uh, if you want to. Uh, you can save, restore, all those things you can do here. So I'm gonna just open the terminal here. Uh, this machine, by the way, doesn't have any GPUs locally attached, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna basically do NVIDIA SMI. And I just basically like, you know, it basically shows half a GPU, actually. it shows one GPU here, okay? And I'm gonna do actually one more thing where I'm gonna create a new workspace. And I'm gonna basically say, you know, let's say demo two, right? I can basically, and I'm gonna pick a pre-installed environment that I already have. And I can say, okay, where I want to basically have the workspace hosted on. It can be on a GPU machine where, let's say I could basically say, well, I could start this workspace on a, an eight GPU machine and I want to basically expand up to 16 GPUs beyond a node, or I could say I could start on a CPU machine, uh, and you know, and I say, you know what, I want basically half a GPU. Yeah. Okay, so I'm great, all right, and just in a bit, this environment should actually, you know, uh, show up. I think it should be a half a GPU workspace. If not, I'll create one more. So while that's actually spinning, I'll create another one. Where I'm gonna basically say, okay, you know what? Some, some random number of GPUs, more than eight. Right. So you look at here, right? It basically just attached half a GPU onto this workspace, right? Similarly, you know, uh, here it basically attached 14 GPUs onto this workspace, right? So, and I can basically go into that other workspace that I have, and I can basically, you know, essentially, I think I already have it here, right? And I can essentially run, like, you know, pretty much any Jupyter code that I have, essentially. And it's gonna basically use the, you know, the GPUs, right? So essentially, like, I can run any, any kind of, you know, iPod or notebook or whatnot. So that's kind of, you know, uh, that's kind of what the, the thing provides. The whole idea here is uh, being able to elastically attach without changing anything. Know, uh, and using it only during, you know, uh, during runtime. I think a few other things that I kind of showed you where I can basically share my volumes, uh, you know, uh, do some node management, add some users, uh, where I'm gonna just create a user, let's say, you know, um, say test. So I'm gonna say the user has limit up to create up to one GPU. Right, so so now when I log in as a user, so if my internet works, you know. I log in as a user, I should be able to see this one GPU. By the way, it kind of shows like, you know, like a view of, you know, what GPUs are used, what GPUs are not used, et cetera. So when I'm doing it here, I have a limit of only up to one GPU that I can create, right? Once I create, let's say, half a GPU, uh, you know, And, and then now when I actually do it, it'll only allow me to actually do like, you know, 
only the remaining half. So, so that's pretty much you know uh, what I had. Uh, you know, I can assure the, the the you know the, the summary is essentially being able to do deep learning development on CPU machines and elastically attached GPUs, just like you do network attached storage. Um, you know, and what we kind of did to integrate with Jupyter here. So we still have about five minutes left. If anybody had questions for Suba. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, the installation is pretty simple. Uh, you know, you basically just uh, do the you know Bitfusion client on a, on any nodes, you know, CPU machine, on also on the GPU machines. And once you have it, you know, you can pretty much, you know, yeah, we you could I mean you could I mean you could basically run it with Jupyter. Essentially, all you do is just invoke Jupyter with the Bitfusion client, and that's it. Uh, and if you do run it that way, um, is it possible to use multiple GPUs? Mm -hmm. that yes. Okay. Yeah, you can use multiple GPUs. Yes. <laughs> It doesn't matter. So, for example, you could have a scenario where I could basically have, let's say, let's say my client running on my laptop, okay, and I could basically have some GPUs on Amazon and remotely attach the GPUs from Amazon onto my laptop. Again, the internet is going to be pretty, you know, uh, slow because of one gig, but you, there's nothing stopping. Anybody from doing it? Would you have to coordinate those GPUs mm -hmm. with the, the server sites? Yeah, so we provide a CFN to actually do that on Amazon. Okay. Yeah, cloud formation template to be able to do that. And then the assumption is that you, you can do this elastic, um, elastic number of machines, but you, all of them can access your data. Can access your data. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you know the in fact the machines you don't need to provide any special provisions for actually you know accessing the data or anything, uh, uh, because you know uh, the tunnel happens through the Bitfusion client, uh, right? So it's, it's just like you know it, think of it as like it basically talks through TCP and it, it has its own port. You just need to expose a port, uh, or expose a few ports. So once you have that, you know you don't need to do any special things to do it. You know I mean, generally we recommend putting in the same VPC if you're using it in Amazon. As many machines as you want. Yep. From third-party service. third services, or if you are in a in your own data center, you could, or in your work workstation, let's say you have four or five people, you could basically share resources. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, we yeah we we support Linux. Yes, uh, but uh, there's nothing actually you know stopping from using it within Windows as well. Um, yes, uh, you know that is one way of actually you know, doing the implementation. The other way is we've actually you know seen is uh, you only spin up the machine when you need them. So you know there's some plugins that yeah we actually we actually provide some plugins and you know things uh, that people integrate in their own you know provisioning flow. So basically uh, you know kind of like what I showed you here, right? Uh, only when I'm basically you know like only when I'm really using it, you go and spin up the machine and get it back to me. But yeah, so. Can it be viewed as a CUDA relay? Yeah. It could be. It's essentially any API relay. So the way we've kind of architected it is, it, tomorrow, let's say, if you have functions, let's say lambdas, okay, and I want to execute lambdas remotely, I could use it for that as well. Any functions? Any other questions? Yeah. Well, well, kind of <laughs> sure. So, still, it's like the, so there's a multi-tenant. Each user in the beginning specifies how many resources that they want. Yeah. Kind of like a Spark situation, right? Dynamic allocation versus static allocation. So in the beginning, no matter what you are going to run, you specify and you allocate those resources. So, so that is one way of actually doing it. The other way is kind of like that gentleman asked, where, for example, let's say I could basically you know, set up, let's say, say you know what, uh, I'm, I'm have, I have the client actually install all these machines. And only when I need something, you basically spin up a machine. And you know, uh, as part of the spin-up process, install the Bitfusion, you know, software, the the server there, and you know, it just starts listening to it, and it automatically gets attached. And once you're done with it, just bring down the machine, right? Pretty much using you know either OpsWorks or any of the provisioning tools that you already have. Now we have seen integration with Kubernetes. We've done integration with Spa, you know, uh, Docker, you know, Swarm. We've done integration with Salt, you know, that people have actually done it. We've done integration with CFN that people have, and sometimes even shell scripts. 
to the cloud. Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.